Hey guys, editing me here, and I did want to let you know that with this video, I unfortunately did struggle quite a bit with the audio. Uh, basically, at the time that I filmed this video, I was using a very, 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 very shitty uh, microphone cord, and it was basically slipping out all the time, and that's what is causing the kind of lapses in sound that you may or may not hear in this video. So I will somewhat be relying a little bit more on the audio from the video and not necessarily from the microphone. Again, I do sincerely apologize. It's a pain in the ass. I hate it. But uh, again, thank you so much for putting up with it with this particular video. This video was a lot of work and I did not feel like refilming it. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, Adrian here. So today is going to be a little bit different. Yes, it is absinthe related, hence the green makeup today, but it's going to be an absinthe haul. So this isn't going to be your typical type of haul. And honestly, YouTube is loaded with a whole bunch of videos out there of people just saying, look at all my fancy shiny shit that I just got. Isn't it cool? Look at me, it's so cool. No, I want to have people walking away from this haul learning something, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because let's be honest, what reason are you here for if you follow me for my absinthe content other than learning about absinthe? I want you to walk away from this video learning about absinthe. So I will be throwing in some fun facts as well as showing you some of the pretty new things, pretty new pieces of absinthe paraphernalia that I have. So needless to say, I'm pretty excited about it and I'm very happy and excited to share these fun facts with you. All right, so this first thing I wanna show you is a bottle of absinthe that was sent to me by this new uh, absinthe company that is based in Canada. Not sure exactly where in Canada, but in Canada nonetheless. This is actually my first time actually opening it, hence the styrofoam. So this is Fish Creek's Green Fairy, and I must say I'm, I'm pretty happy with the packaging. Really pretty, really like it. I'm uh, not too thrilled about the color, I must say. That is really, really pale. Yeah. So I just want to say that you guys may or may not see me do a review of this particular absinthe, and I'll explain why. I had a discussion with the owner of the distillery and they told me that this is their first product that they're putting out there into the absinthe market, which is pretty exciting. I, and I'm always happy to see more products entering the absinthe market. That's always an awesome thing. And he said I was under no obligation to do a review, but he wanted to know what my opinion was of it. And I said, well, since all of my reviews are first impressions, what I could do is I could film a review of this tell you what I think of it, and then if you are okay with how I am expressing my views and opinions on this particular absinthe, then I will make it public so that more people can hear about it, more people can drink it. So to this he agreed, and again he wanted to know what I thought of it, because it's pretty cool that you know brands are actually asking me what I think about their product and how it can be better really awesome to think about that just like mm, so cool so what the owner told me is that he didn't want this to be a copy of a traditional absinthe or a recreation of a traditional absinthe he wanted to do something a little different uh, basically what he did is that he made a base of honey and um, apple I guess like that kind of base of liquor which is really interesting, I've never seen that done before, and then distill it in the traditional manner. So yes, while the method to make it is traditional, its base is not. But I'm excited to try it. I'm excited to see, you know, how it will turn out. Again, I really like the packaging. Uh, I'm not too, mm, I'm a little iffy on the color. Mind you, this is a clear bottle. This is a, a clear bottle, do you see that? It is a clear bottle. This is a very, very pale green, um, hmm. It doesn't fill me with much confidence, but again, uh, what I will do is that I will tell my opinion to the owner of this distillery, and if he's okay with me sharing my opinion, I will of course post it. If not, then maybe I'll make it like a Patreon exclusive uh, video so that my patrons can see it. But yeah, that'll be, uh, 
I'm looking forward to it. I'll see how it goes. Just a quick side note, since I know in one of my music reviews that I did a while back, someone questioned the integrity of the music review because they somehow speculated that I was friends with the artist in question. Um, for that particular video, it was Scarlet Leaves, and never, even once, in that video did I say, oh hey, I'm friends with the band. Not at all. But this person decided to pull that information out of their ass and speculate on the integrity of my reviews, whether it be on music or books or whatnot, or even in this case, absinthe. I want to let you know that I am not going to suck up to an absinthe brand just to get free booze or just to get recognition on their social media or whatnot. That's just a bunch of bullshit. I am not going to compromise myself or compromise my integrity as far as my reviews are concerned. In fact, <laughs> you want to know what happened when I saw that the Absente Instagram page followed me? This was my reaction. So any notion that you may possess that somehow I suck up to absinthe brands in order to get more free, you know, product from them, absolutely not true. No way. That is not what you guys deserve. So here is an absinthe myth busted. So a lot of people think, oh, the green fairy, it, absinthe is called the green fairy because these people would drink absinthe, they would trip balls and they would th see green fairies everywhere. Definitely not the case. So the reason why Absinthe's nickname is La Fée Verte, or the Green Fairy, is because the Green Fairy is a symbol of inspiration. It's a symbol of a creative muse. Like uh, one of the Absinthe paintings that I showed off in my pre-ban art Absinthe video, is that you showed a, a picture of this guy who was who had just had a glass of absinthe and there's this fairy kind of caressing him on the head. So that's kind of a better representation of what absinthe and La Fée Verte represents and represented back then in the pre band era. It wasn't just that, oh hey, I'm gonna drink this stuff, I'm gonna see green fairies, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of stupid. And it really is an oversimplification of what La Fée Verte is, really is. Just not cool. I'm not, I'm not here for it. Uh, a lot of people refer to Absinthe as the Green Fairy because the Green Fairy represents inspiration. Uh, like I said, and I have said in previous videos, Absinthe was favored by a lot of artists and musicians and bohemians and poets and writers so much. So the belief was that Absinthe inspired them and a fairy is a symbol of that inspiration. A fairy is a symbol of a muse that gives you inspiration. As a matter of fact, uh, Alistair Crowley um, did, he, he was indeed an absinthe drinker, which is really interesting, and he referred to absinthe as the green goddess. And a lot of people in that day also did refer to absinthe as the green goddess because, uh, let's be real, she's, she's definitely mysterious. <laughs> Lover. So another myth that I would like to bust for this video is that people knocking back shots of absinthe is a relatively new thing. It actually isn't. I was actually shocked to learn that this did actually start in the pre ban era. So because absinthe was so popular and so high in alcohol content compared to wine, beer, or even cognac, the hardcore alcoholics actually started putting very little water in their absinthe when they went to have it at the cafes so that they could dr get drunk faster. Eventually it got to a point where they would just stop adding water altogether and just ask the waiter for une pure or a pure shot. So it's kind of scary. <laughs> So when you look at the symptoms that followed after a binge drinking and a high alcohol content beverage, uh, pure like that over the course of a day, you start to see a lot of the symptoms that were reported of absinthism or people tripping balls or having hallucinations from absinthe. And during this period, all of those symptoms were attributed specifically to drinking absinthe and drinking absinthe alone, not necessarily attributing those symptoms to just alcoholism in general, which is stupid. Ah. It's amazing what hate campaigns will do. 
After all, the man in Switzerland who allegedly murdered his family in 1905 after having two glasses of absinthe, <sighs> no one mentioned that he had had a lot of wine and a lot of whiskey prior to those glasses of absinthe, but it suited the narrative of the wine lobbyists to blame his murderous actions on absinthe alone. So on top of that, the lower class alcoholics were the ones regularly consuming the cheap, toxic, adulterated knockoff absinthe that was being sold. I've spoken of this before. <laughs> and again, it didn't matter if legitimate high quality absinthe brands were making their absinthe properly or safely, all absinthe and all absinthe drinkers for that matter were unfortunately painted with the same brush really sucky. All right, so the next thing I would like to show you is this amazing t-shirt I'm wearing. Tell me that is not incredible. Tell me that's not beautiful. Just wow. Oh my god, the second I saw this on the, on the internet, I think actually my friend Rory um, brought it to my attention and, and said, hey, look at this, you know, absent t-shirt design. It was for the... Uh, uh, Pierre Distillery in Pontarlier, France. Oh my god, it's so cool. I did a little digging and I was able to find this shirt and I was able to find the artist who made this design, really talented female artist in France. Uh, she's apparently noted for making like album covers for metal artists, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. So what I did is I was able to track down the website, I was able to track down where to buy the t-shirt, and I kind of reached out to my friends in France uh, via Instagram and said, hey man, I'm trying to get a hold of this t-shirt. It's beautiful, it's amazing, I need it in my life. Who would be able to assist me in getting my paws on it? And my wonderful friend, Nefelith, uh, she has her own Instagram account and she posts amazing pictures. She, she's so beautiful, she's so unique, just wonderful. A great example of a goth that lives in France. Yeah. So she was able to buy the t-shirt for me because it would only ship within France, within the vicinity of France, which is really sucky that I couldn't get a hold of it in the United States, but she was able to buy it for me and she forwarded it here to Whidbey Island for me to have. So it's quite possible that I'm the only one in the United States that actually owns this t-shirt. It's pretty cool. Very, very proud of it. And I will leave the information for the artist in this video as well as down below so you can check out their other work. Okay, so time for another fun fact about absinthe. I'm going to discuss the true origin of Blanche or Swiss Bleu absinthe because, gosh, I just love learning new things about absinthe. The more you learn, the more you love it. <laughs> so white absinthe actually became a thing after the ban was implemented in the early 20th century. However, there were clandestine uh, distillers that would continue to make it. Basically what they would do is that they would simply not put the absinthe through the second maceration process that would result in the herbs coloring the liquor green and adding some additional flavor, leaving it clear. So some historians think that this was because clear absinthe was a little bit harder to identify as absinthe after the ban was implemented and it was sold by pharmacies. Now, admittedly, I initially thought it was referred to as le bleu because in times where I've observed the louche of a white absinthe, you can sometimes see little flashes or wisps of blue. Apparently, la bleu was actually kind of a secret code. It refers to how the wormwood plant looks from really far away, like if you look at the wormwood fields. Um, it, like in Val de Torveo, for instance, really fucking cool. From a distance, it has a strange, like a slate gray, slightly blue color. So the term la bleue was used to evoke the idea of the wormwood fields in the uh, Val de Travail in Switzerland, which was Absinthe's birthplace. All right, so the next thing I wanna show you is my Lady Absinthe Fountain. I just got it. So like I said about a month ago, I accidentally broke my beloved uh, Twisted Glass Absinthe Fountain. Uh, it's not completely like gone to waste. What I've done is I've uh, put it on top of a bookshelf in our living room. Uh, just for display because it, it's still a pretty thing and I don't have the heart to throw it out. <laughs> it's just so pretty. So 
I was able to go onto MaisonAbsinthe.com, which is one of my favorite places to shop for absinthe paraphernalia, and I was able to finally get my paws on my dream absinthe fountain. So this, this lady is pretty heavy, I will say. This is very, very heavy. It's made of metal and glass, and it has four taps. And I figured investing in one that had four taps was a little smarter considering that more often I have been having the need for a fountain that has four taps instead of one or two even. <laughs> so uh, basically because I've been having more like absinthe tastings at my house and uh, among groups of people and I thought, you know what, fuck it, I'm just gonna get one with four taps, why not? Now, admittedly, this fountain is not a reproduction of a pre-band design, which uh, I'm very sad about, honestly, but, um, you know, it, it kind of goes against most of my aesthetic where I do want to stay as true to the pre-band era as possible with a lot of my absinthe paraphernalia. Um, making exceptions in some cases. This is definitely one of those cases, as you can see. It's beautiful. Um, but yeah, she's very curvy. She's very sleek. She's very elegant. And I love that she's just holding up this bowl of absinthe and uh, presenting us this gift of La Fée Verte, of inspiration, of the Green Fairy, of the amazing effect that absinthe has on you. So, another myth I will be busting about absinthe is that Dr. Pierre Audenaire, uh invented absinthe and helped to mass produce it in the late 18th century, early 19th century. Not quite. So, to many, including myself, absinthe has had a feminine quality. So, where does this inherent femininity come from? It was actually a peasant woman in the Val de Trovaire on the border of France and Switzerland who developed the original recipe for absinthe as a cure-all tonic, and it was called Mother Andriot's uh, Health Elixir. So Frenchman Dr. Pierre Audenaire uh, gave it to his sick patients and it was a hit. It worked. It was a healthy tonic and it was really helping people feel better, especially with digestive is issues because that's a originally what absinthe was developed to treat. So a trader named uh, Dubide bought the recipe and the formula from the peasant woman, teamed up with Bernot, and was the first to mass produce it in Switzerland in 1797. Later, Pernod Fils moved to Pontalier, France, right on the other side of the border, because of a high alcohol tax in Switzerland. So Pernod Fils would later become the biggest mass producer of absinthe in France. And yes, that little sample of pre band absinthe that I had was indeed a uh, Pernod made in 1900. <sighs> I can't wait to try pre band absinthe again. It really was amazing. So here's a little bit of information about why the true origin of absinthe may have been uh, clouded, no pun intended, or covered up really interesting. By the way, I sincerely apologize for the bad quality of this clip I'm about to show you. However, it couldn't be avoided. I tried taking a screen recording of it, but it simply wouldn't let me because it counted as uh, protected content. But this is from a documentary about absinthe that I absolutely loved. I will leave a link for it in the description below. You guys need to see it. In reality, I think we have obscured the loisir in this dossier of who invented absinthe. And for a reason, maybe too simple, it's that it's a dame. Finally, on va dire une une dame herboriste, mais qui était une paysanne, tout simplement, qui connaissait les plantes, mais comme le commun des paysans à cette époque-là. Donc, en réalité, il y avait déjà cette idée que l'absinthe, de toute façon, c'était une plante magique, mais du côté des femmes. Et que donc, là, d'un seul coup, ce soit à nouveau une femme qui, quelque part, fasse le saut décisif, donc, dans le domaine de l'apéritif, ça a fait qu'on a continué à regarder ça avec un œil, mais après tout, c'est de l'alchimie féminine, et ça fait peur, et les hommes le regardaient d'un, on va dire, d'un œil plutôt méfiant. All right, so the next thing I want to show you is my new absinthe spoon holder. And yes, once again, this is a reproduction of a 19th century 
design, which is great. So I've been kind of wanting something to properly hold and display my Absin spoons for quite a while. And I finally broke down and I got this really nice and heavy, really sturdy, fantastic. I just love it. And it really does a great job of holding my Absin spoons. As a matter of fact, you would actually see something like this in the absinthe cafes in France during the 19th century. So, you know, people would belly up to the bar, they would ask for absinthe, there would be one of these holding a bunch of absinthe spoons and they would choose from to start the absinthe ritual. So here's another fact about absinthe I would love to give you. So there were apparently two ways that the bartender could track how much absinthe you had been drinking at the bar that night so that they could calculate your tab at the end of the evening really really interesting stuff I love it so they would use two methods one would be saucers and two would be marked bottles so the saucers were kind of like a 19th century version of a sushi bar with a revolving conveyor belt so once you polish off the sushi that you would grab from this conveyor belt you would stack up the saucers it served on and the waiter would calculate your tab based on that it's a very similar concept for what you would do in an absinthe bar. So you could potentially keep the same glass of absinthe, but each time the waiter would refill your glass, he'd give you a new saucer to add to your stack of saucers on the bar to calculate how much you owed at the end of the evening. Really, really cool thing to think about, and it's really clever. So by a similar token, you could also be given a glass bottle of absinthe with little marks or bubbles that were used to measure how many glasses of absinthe you had till you left the bar. You weren't obligated to drink the entire bottle, mind you, but the waiter would calculate your tab based on how many of the marks or the bubbles that you had passed and based on the increments in there. So again, it's really interesting to see that there were these methods of calculating your tab whenever you would go out and drink absinthe. That's <laughs> It's so fucking cool, I love it. All right, so the next item I would love to show to you is this. This is an absinthe spoon, and it has a really pretty, really lovely star design. And I really love how this is crafted, it's really beautiful. And this is, once again, a reproduction of a 19th century design. I really love the kind of seashell detailing here. I love the length of the nose or the tongue of the spoon. Some people call it a nose, some people call it a tongue, whatever. But it's really pretty. Not really much to say about it other than it's a pre-band design and it's gorgeous. Uh, definitely one I'm glad to have in my collection. So here is yet another myth that needs to be busted. Higher Thujone content and absinthe equals more likely to trip balls and get high. You know, Thujone is obviously a hallucinogen, obviously. The answer is a big, resounding no. So the absinthe brand owners, the distillers, and the experts that I've had the pleasure of connecting with overseas in Europe, where the Thujone content limit of absinthe is significantly higher than it is here, have said that it makes absolutely no difference in how it affects them. So mind you, once again, in the United States, you can have absinthe imported here or made here just as long as it has less than 10 parts per million of thujone, and that's what the FDA defines as thujone free, right? <laughs> so in the European Union, the thujone content for absinthe is actually 35 parts per million, which it sounds like it's a lot higher, but it really doesn't really make it much of a difference. And you know, the experts and brand owners and distillers that I have spoken to have also said that even if it is an amount that exceeds 35 parts per million for Thujone content, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. It's really interesting. So once again, Thujone is not a hallucinogen. It is a neurotoxin. It's still in such minute trace amounts that you would die of alcohol poisoning many times over before you'd you know, trip balls, get high, or just simply collapse to the floor in convulsions. Again, the US limit of thujone content for absinthe is 10 parts per million or less of thujone. That does not mean that absinthe in the United States does not have wormwood. It definitely does. But you would have to make so much wormwood with absinthe in order to produce any kind of ill effect. And that's just referring to the thujone content for the 10 parts per million reference. That's what the FDA defines as thujone free. And 
Do you know another liquor that was made from wormwood that was actually named for it being made of wormwood? Vermouth. Vermouth. I shit you not. Vermouth is made from wormwood. That's literally where it gets its name. Vermouth in German, I think, means wormwood. Again, it's really interesting that there was this huge campaign to get rid of absinthe. You know, oh, it has wormwood, which has thujone. Thujone's harmful. Thujone is causing all of these hallucinations and these convulsions and people to go crazy and kill themselves. No. <laughs> no. Not at all. If you're going to blame one particular type of liquor for those ill effects, blame others too. Don't, mm, mm, it just makes you so mad. So compared to absinthe, which was banned for almost a hundred years in the United States, as far as I know, and from the research that I've been able to gather, <laughs> vermouth was never banned. It was never ever banned. Isn't that strange? And finally, I'm going to add one more fact to this video before we wrap up. So apparently working in the absinthe fields was work that was reserved for women. Really interesting. So that's something else that kind of adds to the feminine quality that absinthe possesses. The people who worked in the fields to pick the wormwood plants and other botanicals that uh, were used to make absinthe were women. It was hard work and apparently it was really, really good for you to be working out in those fields. They made really good money and on top of that, the women who worked in these fields ended up living to be over 100 years old. That's incredible. <laughs> of course, you know, uh, one of the people that lived the longest, like one of the world record for longest living people, I think was a French woman and she lived to be 122 years old and she outlived both her children and her grandchildren, which is crazy. That's insane. And apparently she smoked and drank wine every single day. Wow, that's crazy. And then my own grandmother, uh, she passed away a few years ago, uh, my paternal grandmother, who was French, mind you, <laughs> she lived to be 96. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was my absinthe haul and sprinkled in between the pretty new shinies that I got were some fun facts and some myth busting about absinthe. So I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed making it. It was so fun to share this knowledge with you and honestly sharing is caring and I really love sharing fun facts with people that I care about. Hell, Kenny and I were actually losing our minds over an episode of true facts about <laughs> Uh, on YouTube earlier today where they were talking about hummingbirds. Kind of interesting. Actually, really interesting. <laughs> I really encourage you to watch it if you've not seen it yet. Definitely. Go see it. So, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and make sure you hit that bell for notifications. Thank you so much to my patrons for your support. You're amazing. I really appreciate it. And to all of you, I love you, and I will see you guys later. Bye! Thank you.